to it. Mom and Dad's bedroom was on the second floor, where the station manager once had his office. We kids slept downstairs in what had been the waiting room. The old restrooms were still there, but the toilet had been ripped out of one and a bathtub put in its place. The ticket booth had been converted into a kitchen. Some of the original benches were still bolted to the unpainted wood walls, and you could see the dark, worn spots where prospectors and miners and their wives and children had sat waiting for the train, their behinds polishing the wood. Since we didn't have money for furniture, we improvised a bunch of huge wooden spools, the kind that hold industrial cable, had been dumped on the side of the tracks not far from our house, so we rolled them home and turned them into tables. What kind of fools would go waste money on store-bought tables when they can have these for free? Dad said as he pounded the tops of the spools to show us how sturdy they were. For chairs, we used some smaller spools and a few crates. Instead of beds, we kids each slept in a big cardboard box, like the ones refrigerators get delivered in. A little while after we'd moved into the depot, we heard mom and dad talking about buying us kids real beds. And we said they shouldn't do it. We liked our boxes. They made going to bed seem like an adventure. Shortly after we moved into the depot, mom decided that what we really needed was a piano. Dad found a cheap upright when a saloon in the next town over went out of business, and he borrowed a neighbor's pickup to bring it home. We slid it off the pickup, down a ramp, but it was too heavy to carry. To get it into the depot, Dad devised a system of ropes and pulleys that he attached to the piano in the front yard and ran through the house and out the back door, where they were tied to the pickup. The plan was for Mom to ease the truck forward, pulling the piano into the house while Dad and we kids guided it up a ramp of planks and through the front door. Ready. Dad hollered when we were all in our positions. Okie dokie, Mom shouted. But instead of easing forward, Mom, who had never quite gotten the hang of driving, hit the gas pedal hard, and the truck shot ahead. The piano jerked out of our hands, sending us lurching forward, and bounced into the house, splintering the door frame. Dad screamed at Mom to slow down, but she kept going and dragged the screeching, cord-banging piano across the depot floor and right through the rear door, splintering its frame, too, then out into the backyard, where it came to rest next to a thorny bush. Dad came running through the house. What the Sam Hill were you doing? He yelled at Mom. I told you to go slow. I was only doing 25. Mom said, you get mad at me when I go that slow on the highway. She looked behind her and saw the piano sitting in the backyard. Oopsie daisy, she said. Mom wanted to turn around and drag it back into the house from the other direction. But Dad said that was impossible because the railroad tracks were too close to the front door to get the pickup in position. So, the piano stayed where it was. On the days Mom felt inspired, she took her sheet music and one of our spool chairs outside and pounded away at her music back there. Most pianists never get the chance to play in the great out of doors, she said. And now the whole neighborhood can enjoy the music, too. Dad got a job as an electrician in a bearite mine. He left early and came home early, and in the afternoons we all played games. 
Dad taught us cards. He tried to show us how to be steely-eyed poker players, but I wasn't very good. Dad said you could read my face like a traffic light. Even though I wasn't much of a bluffer, I'd sometimes win a hand. Because I was always getting excited by even mediocre cards, like a pair of fives, which made Brian and Lori think I'd been dealt aces. Dad also invented games for us to play, like the ergo game, in which he'd make two statements of fact and we had to answer a question based on those statements, or else say insufficient information to draw a conclusion and explain why. When Dad wasn't there, we invented our own games. We didn't have many toys, but you didn't need toys in a place like Battle Mountain. We'd get a piece of cardboard and go tobogganing down the depot's narrow staircase. We'd jump off the roof of the depot, using an army surplus blanket as our parachute and letting our legs buckle under us. When we hit the ground, like Dad had taught us real parachutists do, we'd put a piece of scrap metal, or a penny, if we were feeling extravagant, on the railroad tracks right before the train came. After the train had roared by, the massive wheels churning, we'd run to get our newly flattened, hot and shiny piece of metal. The thing we liked to do most was go exploring in the desert. We'd get up at dawn, my favorite time, when the shadows were long and purple and you still had the whole day ahead of you. Sometimes dad went with us, and we'd march through the sagebrush military style, with dad calling out orders in a sing-song chant, hup, two, three, four, and then we'd stop and do push-ups or dad would hold out his arm so we could do pull-ups on it. Mostly, Brian and I went exploring by ourselves. That desert was filled with all sorts of amazing treasures. We had moved to Battle Mountain because of the gold in the area, but the desert also had tons of other mineral deposits. There was silver and copper and uranium and barite, which Dad said oil drilling rigs used. Mom and Dad could tell what kind of minerals and ore were in the ground from the color of the rock and soil, and they taught us what to look for. Iron was in the red rocks, copper in the green. There was so much turquoise, nuggets and even big chunks of it lying on the desert floor, that Brian and I could fill our pockets with it until the weight practically pulled our pants down. You could also find arrowheads and fossils and old bottles that had turned deep purple from lying under the broiling sun for years. You could find the sun-parched skulls of coyotes and empty tortoise shells and the rattles and shed skins of rattlesnakes. And you could find great big bullfrogs that had stayed in the sun too long, and were completely dried up and as light as a piece of paper. On Sunday night, if Dad had money, we'd all go to the Owl Club for dinner. The Owl Club was world famous, according to the sign. Where a hoot owl wearing a chef's hat pointed the way to the entrance. Off to one side was a room with rows of slot machines that were constantly clinking and ticking and flashing lights. Mom said the slot players were hypnotized. Dad said they were damn fools. Never play the slots. Dad told us they're for suckers who rely on luck. Dad knew all about statistics, and he explained how the casinos stacked the odds against the slot players. When Dad gambled, he preferred poker and pool. Games of skill, not chance. Whoever coined the phrase, a man's got to 
Play the hand that was dealt him, was most certainly one piss poor. Bluffer, Dad said, the Owl Club had a bar where groups of men with sunburned necks huddled together over beers and cigarettes. They all knew Dad, and whenever he walked in, they insulted him in a loud funny way that was meant to be friendly. This joint must be going to hell in a handbasket if they're letting in sorry ass characters like you. They'd shout, hell, my presence here has a positively elevating effect compared to you mangy coyotes. Dad would yell back. They'd all throw their heads back and laugh and slap one another between the shoulder blades. We always sat at one of the red booths. Such good manners. The waitress would exclaim, because mom and dad made us say, sir, and ma'am, and yes, please, and thank you. They're damned smart, too. Dad would declare, finest damn kids ever, walked the planet, and we'd smile and order hamburgers or chili dogs, and milkshakes and big plates of onion rings that glistened with hot grease. The waitress brought the food to the table and poured the milk shakes from a sweating metal container into our glasses. There was always some left over, so she kept the container on the table for us to finish. Looks like you hit the jackpot and got something extra. She'd say with a wink. We always left the owl club so stuffed we could hardly walk. Let's waddle home, kids. Dad would say. The Bearite mine where Dad worked had a commissary, and the mine owner deducted our bill and the rent for the depot out of Dad's paycheck. Every month, at the beginning of each week, we went to the commissary and brought home bags and bags of food. Mom said only people, brainwashed by advertising bought prepared food such as SpaghettiOs and TV dinners. She bought the basics, sacks of flour or cornmeal, powdered milk, onions, potatoes, 20-pound bags of rice or pinto, beans, salt, sugar, yeast for making bread, cans of jack mackerel, a canned ham or a fat slab of bologna, and for dessert, cans of sliced peaches. Mom didn't like cooking much. Why spend the afternoon making a meal that will be gone in an hour? She'd ask us, when in the same amount of time, I can do a painting that will last forever, so once a week or so, she'd fix a big cast iron vat of something like fish and rice, or, usually, beans. We'd all sort through the beans together, picking out the rocks, then mom would soak them overnight, boil them the next day, with an old ham bone to give them flavor, and for that entire week, we'd have beans for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. If the beans started going bad, we'd just put extra spice in them, like the Mexicans at the LBJ. Apartments always did. We bought so much food that we never had much money come payday. One payday dad owed the mine company 11 cents. He thought it was funny and told them to put it on his tab. Dad almost never went out drinking at night like he used to. He stayed home with us. After dinner, the whole family stretched out on the benches in the floor of the depot and read, with the dictionary in the middle of the room so we kids could look up words we didn't know. Sometimes I discussed the definitions with dad, and if we didn't agree with what the dictionary writers said, we sat down and wrote a letter to the publishers. They'd write back, defending their position, which would prompt an even longer letter from dad, and if they replied again, so would he, until we stopped hearing 
From the dictionary people, Mom read everything. Charles Dickens, William Faulkner, Henry, Miller, Pearl Buck. She even read James Michener, apologetically, saying she knew it wasn't great literature, but she couldn't help herself. Dad preferred science and math books, biographies and history. We kids read whatever Mom brought home from her weekly trips to the library. Brian read thick adventure books, ones written by guys like Zane Gray. Lori especially loved Freddy the Pig and all the Oz books. I liked the Laura Ingalls Wilder stories and the We Were There series about kids who lived at great historical moments, but my very favorite was Black Beauty. Occasionally, on those nights when we were all reading together, a train would thunder by, shaking the house and rattling the windows. The noise was thunderous, but after we'd been there a while, we didn't. Even hear it, Mom and Dad enrolled us in the Mary S. Black Elementary School, a long, low building with an asphalt playground that turned gooey in the hot sun. My second grade class was filled with the children of miners and gamblers, scabby kneed and dusty from playing in the desert, with uneven home scissored bangs. Our teacher, Miss Page, was a small, pinched woman, given to sudden rages and savage thrashings with her ruler. Mom and Dad had already taught me nearly everything Miss Page was teaching the class. Since I wanted the other kids to like me, I didn't raise my hand all the time the way I had in Blythe. Dad accused me of coasting. Sometimes he made me do my arithmetic homework in binary numbers because he said I needed to be challenged. Before class, I'd have to recopy it into Arabic numbers, but one day I didn't have time, so I turned in the assignment in its binary version. What's this? Miss Page asked. She pressed her lips together as she studied the circles and lines that covered my paper, then looked up at me suspiciously. Is this a joke? I tried to explain to her about binary numbers and how they were the system that computers used and how Dad said they were far superior to other numeric systems. Miss Page stared at me. It wasn't the assignment, she said impatiently. She made me stay late and redo the homework. I didn't tell Dad because I knew he'd come to school to debate Miss Page about the virtues of various numeric systems. Lots of other kids lived in our neighborhood, which was known as the tracks, and after school we all played together. We played red light, green light, tag, football, red rover, or nameless games that involved running hard, keeping up with the pack, and not crying if you fell down. All the families who lived around the tracks were tight on cash. Some were tighter than others, but all of us kids were scrawny and sunburned, and wore faded shorts and raggedy shirts and sneakers with holes or no shoes at all. What was most important to us was who ran the fastest and whose daddy wasn't a wimp. My dad was not only not a wimp, he came out to play with the gang, running alongside us, tossing us up in the air and wrestling against the entire pack without getting hurt. Kids from the tracks came knocking at the door, and when I answered, they asked, Can your dad come out and play? Lori, Brian, and I, and even Maureen, could go pretty much anywhere and do just about anything we wanted. Mom believed that children shouldn't be burdened with a lot of rules and restrictions. Dad whipped us with his belt, but never out of anger, and only if we back-talked or disobeyed a direct order, 
which was rare. The only rule was that we had to come home when the streetlights went on and use your common sense, mom said. She felt it was good for kids to do what they wanted because they learned a lot from their mistakes. Mom was not one of those fussy mothers who got upset when you came home dirty or played in the mud or fell and cut yourself. She said people should get things like that out of their systems when they were young. Once an old nail ripped my thigh while I was climbing over a fence at my friend Carla's house. Carla's mother thought I should go to the hospital for stitches and a tetanus shot. Nothing but a minor flesh wound. Mom declared after studying the deep gash. People these days run to the hospital every time. They skin their knees. She added, we're becoming a nation of sissies. With that, she sent me back out to play. Some of the rocks I found while I was exploring out in the desert were so beautiful that I could not bear the idea of leaving them there. So I started a collection. Brian helped me with it, and together we found garnets and granite and obsidian and Mexican crazy lace, and more and more turquoise. Dad made necklaces. For mom out of all that turquoise, we discovered large sheets of mica that you could pound into powder and then rub all over your body so you'd shimmer under the Nevada sun as if you were coated with diamonds. Lots of times Brian and I thought we'd found gold and we'd stagger home with an entire bucketful of sparkling nuggets, but it was always iron pyrite fool's gold. Some of it dad said we should keep, because it was especially good quality for fool's gold. My favorite rocks to find were geodes, which mom said came from the volcanoes that had erupted to form the Tuscarora Mountains millions of years ago, during the Miocene period. From the outside, geodes looked like boring round rocks, but when you broke them open with a chisel and hammer, the insides were hollow, like a cave, and the walls were covered with glittering white quartz crystals or sparkling purple amethysts. I kept my rock collection behind the house, next to mom's piano, which was getting a little weathered. Lori and Brian and I would use the rocks to decorate the graves of our pets that had died or of the dead animals we found and decided should get a proper burial. I also held rock sales. I didn't have that many customers, because I charged hundreds of dollars for a piece of flint. In fact, the only person who ever bought one of my rocks was dad. He came out behind the house one day with a pocketful of change and was startled when he saw the price tags I'd taped to each rock. Honey, your inventory might move a little faster if you dropped your prices, he said. I explained that all my rocks were incredibly valuable and I'd rather keep them than sell them for less than they were worth. Dad gave me his crooked smile. Sounds like you've thought this through. Pretty well, he said. He told me he had his heart set on buying a particular piece of rose quartz but didn't have the $600 I was charging, so I cut the price to $500 and let him have it on. Credit. Brian and I loved to go to the dump. We looked for treasures among the discarded stoves and refrigerators the broken furniture and stacks of bald tires. We chased after the desert rats that lived in the wrecked cars, or caught tadpoles and frogs in the scum-topped pond. Buzzards circled overhead, and the air was filled with dragonflies the size of small birds. There were no trees to speak of in Battle Mountain, but one corner of the 
Dump had huge piles of railroad ties and rotting lumber that were great for climbing and carving your initials on. We called it the woods. Toxic and hazardous wastes were stored in another corner of the dump. Where you could find old batteries, oil drums, paint cans, and bottles. With skulls and crossbones. Brian and I decided some of this stuff would make for a neat scientific experiment, so we filled up a couple of boxes with different bottles and jars and took them to an abandoned shed we named our laboratory. At first we mixed things together, hoping they would explode, but nothing happened, so I decided we should conduct an experiment to see if any of the stuff was flammable. The next day after school we came back to the laboratory with a box of dad's matches. We unscrewed the lids of some of the jars, and I dropped in matches, but still nothing happened. So we mixed up a batch of what Brian called nuclear fuel, pouring different liquids into a can. When I tossed in the match, a cone of flame shot up with a whoosh like a jet afterburner. Brian and I were knocked to our feet. When we stood up, one of the walls was on fire. I yelled to Brian that we had to get out of there, but he was throwing sand at the fire, saying that we had to put it out or we'd get in trouble. The flames were spreading toward the door, eating up that dry old wood in no time. I kicked out a board in the back wall and squeezed through. When Brian didn't follow, I ran up the street calling for help. I saw Dad walking home from work. We ran back to the shack. Dad kicked in more of the wall and pulled Brian out coughing. I thought Dad would be furious, but he wasn't. He was sort of quiet. We stood on the street watching the flames devour the shack. Dad had an arm around each of us. He said it was an incredible coincidence that he happened to be walking by. Then he pointed to the top of the fire, where the snapping yellow flames dissolved into an invisible shimmery heat that made the desert beyond seem to waver, like a mirage. Dad told us, that zone was known in physics as the boundary between turbulence and order. It's a place where no rules apply, or at least they haven't figured. I'm out yet, he said. You all got a little too close to it today.